In this series, I will be unpacking the concepts of the Bhagavad Gita. My inspiration for the series came from the audiobook by Jack Hawley, The Bhagavad Gita, a walkthrough for Westerners. I will be referencing Jack's book, as well as other Bhagavad Gita resources found online. I've included relevant links in the description below. This series will be my further exploration and personal understanding of the Gita. I hope you find this to be beneficial for you and your personal journey. Chapter 1. The Despondency of Arjuna To set the stage, the Bhagavad Gita is a chapter within a larger story, the Mahabharata. This chapter conveys a conversation between the divine and a prince named Arjuna. And during this conversation, Arjuna is given the answer to the ultimate question. What is the meaning of life? The story takes place on a battlefield as a great war is about to begin. Krishna is the guide and charioteer for his dear friend Arjuna. Arjuna is a prince who is at war with his cousin. In this war, Arjuna represents the divine virtues such as truth, justice, right action and compassion, while his cousin represents the three gates to hell, which is desire, greed and anger. This war represents a metaphor for the war each of us faces in our daily lives. Making matters complicated for Arjuna is the fact that within the army of his cousin are many of his beloved teachers, family and friends, including his grandfather, the field commander Bhishma. As the war is about to begin, Arjuna asks Krishna to draw the chariot to a position where he could view both the armies. As his eyes fell upon many of his beloved people within the army of the enemy, Arjuna falls into despair and drops his weapons. Slumped in defeat and sorrow, Arjuna declares he will not fight. Now it is worth noting at this point that Arjuna is actually a great and renowned warrior. He has a powerful arm on his side, he has a good chance of winning, but he doesn't see the cost of lives lost on both sides as being worth the cost of any goal. I would not kill them, even for three worlds. Why then for this poor earth? It matters not if I myself am killed. It is at this moment of Arjuna's greatest despair that Krishna assumes his true role as the ultimate teacher. Chapter 2 Sankhya Yoga The Path of Knowledge Krishna, seeing Arjuna overwhelmed with compassion, his eyes dimmed with flowing tears and full of despondency, consoles him. He reminds Arjuna of the reputation he has built as a noble and fearless warrior. If he refuses to fight, he will never be respected again and all those around him will believe him to be a coward. Destroying the respect he has worked so hard to build. Arjuna argues that he will not be able to live with himself if he has to kill his teachers or even his cousins. Rather would I content myself with a beggar's crust than kill these teachers of mine, these precious noble souls. To slay these masters who are my benefactors would be to stain the sweetness of life's pleasures with their blood. Arjuna begs Krishna for guidance. Lord Krishna replies, The wise grieve neither for the dead nor the living. There was never a time when I was not, nor you, nor these princes. There will never be a time when we shall cease to be. As the soul experiences in this body infancy, youth, old age and finally death, it then passes into a new body. Death pertains to the body and not the Atma. The Atman, which is the spirit or soul within, which pervades all that we see, is imperishable. Nothing can destroy the spirit. It was not born, it will never die. Nor once having been, can it cease to be. Unborn, eternal, ever enduring, changeless, yet most ancient, the spirit does not die when the body dies. As a person discards their old clothes and puts on new, so the spirit throws off its worn-out bodies and takes fresh ones. Be not anxious about these armies, Arjuna. The spirit in man is imperishable. Those external factors which bring cold and heat, pain and happiness, joy and sorrow, they come and go. They are not permanent. Endure them bravely, O Prince. The hero whose soul is unmoved by circumstance, who accepts pleasure and pain, profit and loss, victory and defeat, with equal measure, only they are fit for immortality or immersion in the divine. 
Remember that one's Svat Dharma, or duty in life, is the highest service to the Atman, or true self within. For a warrior such as you, one's duty to fight against evil, greed, cruelty and jealousy is your highest duty, and you must not shy away from it. Arjuna, I have given you a brief explanation on the Atman. Now listen carefully, and I will explain a practical method, Karma Yoga, by means of which you shall break through the bondage of all action. On this path, endeavor is never wasted, nor can it ever be repressed. Even a very little of its practice protects one from the cycle of death and rebirth. You have the right to work or action in this world, but do not be attached to the fruits of your labor. While no one can deny you the outcomes of your action, you can refuse to be attached or driven by these rewards. It is only the petty-minded who work for reward alone. Physical action is far inferior to a mind concentrated on the divine. The sages, guided by pure intellect, renounce attachment to the fruits of action. And freed from the chains of rebirth, they reach the highest bliss. Arjuna asks, My lord, how can we recognize the saint who has attained pure intellect, who has reached the state of bliss and whose mind is ready? How do they talk? How do they live? And how do they act? Lord Krishna replied, When a person has given up the desires of the heart, and is satisfied with the self alone, be sure that they have reached the highest state. The sage whose mind is unruffled in suffering, whose desire is not roused by enjoyment, who is without attachment, anger or fear, take them to be one who stands at that lofty level. They who, wherever they go, is attached to no person and to no place, who accepts good and evil alike, neither welcoming the one nor repulsed by the other, Take them to be one who is merged in the infinite. They who can withdraw their senses from the attraction of objects as the tortoise draws their limbs within their shells. Take it that such a one has attained perfection. Restraining them all, they meditate steadfastly on the divine. For they who conquer their senses achieve perfection. When a person dwells on the objects of the sense, they create an attraction for them. Attraction develops into desire and desire breeds anger. Anger induces delusion. Through delusion, reason is shattered, and loss of reason leads to destruction. But the self-controlled soul who moves among sense objects, free from either attachment or repulsion, they win eternal peace. Having attained peace, they become free from misery. For when the mind gains peace, right action follows. Right action is not for those who cannot concentrate. Without concentration, there cannot be meditation. They who cannot meditate must not expect peace. And without peace, how can anyone expect happiness? Therefore, Arjuna, they who keep their senses detached from their objects, take it that their mind is purified. The saint is awake when the world sleeps, and they ignore that for which the world lives. This is the state of the Self, the Supreme Spirit, to which, if a person once attains, it shall never be taken from them. Even at the time of leaving the body, they will remain firmly enthroned there and will become one with the Eternal. Never forget that the true goal of life is nothing short of merging with the Divine Consciousness itself. Chapter 3 Karma Yoga – The Path of Action Arjuna questioned, My lord, you are adding to my confusion. If knowledge is above action, why do you advise me to engage in this terrible fight? Fighting is action. Please be clearer. Which is the best path for my spiritual welfare? Lord Krishna replied, In this world, there are two paths. There is the path of knowledge for the contemplative person and the path of action for the busy, action-orientated person. Remember, True knowledge is knowing the Atman, the true self within. When you clarify your intellect through either contemplation or selfless action, you get to realize the Atman. Both parts lead to realization of the self. No person can attain freedom or perfection by merely refusing to act. They cannot even for a moment remain really inactive, for the qualities of nature such as eating, sleeping and breathing 
will compel them to act. They who remain motionless, refusing to act, but all the while brooding over sensuous objects, that deluded soul is simply a hypocrite. But Arjuna, they whose mind controls the senses, they are beginning to practice Karma Yoga, the path of right action, keeping themselves always unattached. Do your duty, Arjuna, for duty-orientated action is superior to inaction. In this world, people are bound to the cycle of birth, death and rebirth by their actions, unless their actions are performed as a sacrifice. When the person offers up both the action and the fruits of that action to divinity, then that action is non-binding. Therefore, Arjuna, let your acts be done without attachment, as a sacrifice only. Sacrifice in this case meaning helping, offering, actions in some way dedicated to the well-being of all humanity. Consider nature. All creatures are the product of food. Food is the product of rain. Rain comes from sacrifice by nature. And sacrifice is the noblest form of action. Arjuna, when you strike a balance in life between giving and getting, when you engage in selfless service, which is sacrifice, your desires are fulfilled, unasked by nature. Righteous people give more than they receive. Indebted ones get more than they give. The one who receives without giving is stealing. Even eat your food in the spirit of sacrifice. Then you are freed from the strong attachment of tastiness and enjoyment that so quickly binds one to physical gratification, which is a bottomless pit. Those who do not contribute in some way to the betterment of all mankind, but instead lead a sinful life, rejoicing in the gratification of their senses, they squander their life. On the other hand, the soul who meditates on the Atman within, who is content to serve the Atman, and rests satisfied within the Atman, there remains nothing more for them to accomplish. They have nothing to gain or lose but the success or failure of their actions. Their welfare does not depend on any contribution that any earthly creature can make. Each selfless act done by this person contributes to Brahman, the highest form of divinity. Therefore, do your duty, in your case as a warrior prince, perfectly, without care for the outcome, for they who do their duty attain the supreme. This world is a learning ground, a place to discipline, train, and to elevate all beings. Make this process as automatic as your breath or heartbeat. If we decline to learn, we cannot derive the benefit. There is nothing in this universe, Arjuna, that I am compelled to do, nor anything for me to attain, yet I am persistently active. For if I were to stop action, people would be glad to do likewise. And if I were to cease to act, the human race would be ruined. It would lead the world to cosmic chaos, and destruction would follow. As the ignorant act for their own selfish desires, so should the wise act without such attachment, fixing their eyes only on the welfare of the world, towards dharma, right action. Do not confuse the ignorant who are hungry for selfish action. Let them continue to work, but show them by example that work can be made sacred when done in the right spirit, with the heart fixed on divinity, thus inspiring all to do the same. Action is the product of the qualities inherent in nature. It is only the ignorant person who, misled by personal egotism, says, I am the doer. All action is performed by worldly nature, not the self or the Atman within. The Atman is beyond all action, beyond all karma. The wise one, aware of this, stands apart and watches this play of nature. They do not refrain from action, surrendering their actions to me, their thoughts concentrated on the Absolute. Free from selfish desires, they go forth and fight the battle of life. Arjuna asks, My Lord, tell me what is it that drives a man to sin, even against his will, as if by compulsion? Lord Krishna replies, It is desire. Desire consumes and corrupts everything. It is man's greatest enemy. As fire is shrouded in smoke, a mirror by dust, 
and a child by the womb. True knowledge is concealed by desire. Selfish desires are bottomless pits. The more you feed them, the more they crave. And anger is always linked with desire. The desire-anger combination is your most formidable enemy in life. Desires are enemies when directed outward, but allies when pointed inward towards divinity. To spiritually advanced people, desire is like the smoke, and it is easily blown away to reveal the light of knowledge. For worldly court people, desire is more like the dust that requires vigorous wiping so that the light can shine. For really dull persons, desire so enfold them, they are like the embryo, buried in the darkness. Only time and a new birth will bring light. Greed is desire swollen to grotesque size. It is our likes and dislikes that give birth to one's nature. One might argue that if we are pawns of our own nature, why bother to restrain it? The idea is not to restrain your nature, but to progressively improve your nature. The senses are powerful, but beyond the senses is the mind. Beyond the mind is the intellect. And far beyond and greater than intellect is the Atman. Therefore, Arjuna, first control your senses and then slay desire so that the Atman can shine. Chapter 4 Yana Kama Sanyasa Yoga Integrating Knowledge, Action and Renunciation Lord Krishna said, I taught these same eternal truths to Surya, the sun god. He passed them on to his son Manu, the earliest man, and he to his son Ikshvaku, the very first king, so that he could better handle his worldly duties. Handed down through the ages, eminent sages learned these great secrets, but in time the right people became scarce, and it was forgotten. It is the same ancient path I now reveal to you, since you are my dearest friend. It is the supreme secret. Arjuna is puzzled. My lord, Surya and those others were born eons before you. How could you have revealed it to them? Lord Krishna replies, Arjuna, people say the sun rises and sets. In truth it is always there always eternal. In the same way, to human perception, I have been born into this earth again and again, from time to time. As have you, Arjuna. All of my existence as eternal Atma are known to me, but you in this present lifetime have forgotten yours. Whenever goodness and dharma, that is right action, weaken, then Arjuna, I reincarnate myself, to re-establish the balance of goodness over wickedness, to explain the divine plan and model for life, I am reborn from age to age. They who realize the divine truth concerning my birth and life are not born again, and when they leave their body, they become one with me, the Atma. Howsoever mankind try to worship me, so do I welcome them. By whatever path they travel, it leads to me. To those who see me as their master, I welcome them as my disciple. To those who see me as friend, I approach as friend. Even to those who see me as enemy, I approach as enemy. All parts lead to me, divinity. At the beginning, I established the four groupings of society according to the natural distribution of qualities and instincts for the more harmonious operation of society. Know, Arjuna, that although all people are at their core one, there are differences within them based on their karma, the consequences of their past actions, and their natural makeup and know that even though I am the author of these distinctions, I, the Atma within, am untouched by them because I am beyond all karmas, all consequences of my actions. What is action and what is inaction? It is a question which has bewildered the wise. But I will declare to you the true wisdom of action, and knowing it, you shall be free from bondage. It is necessary to consider what is right action, what is wrong action, and what is inaction? They who can see inaction in action, and action in inaction, is the wisest among humankind. They are a saint even though they still act. For whatever they undertake is free from the motive of desire, and their deeds are purified by the fire of wisdom. Having surrendered all claim to the results of their actions, always contented and independent, they are not bound by their actions. 
the truly wise act without scheming for the fruits of their actions, and are therefore without inner turmoil. This breaks the chains of karma. All their selfish desires have been consumed in the fire of knowing that they are not the body or the doer, but are indeed the Atma, the true self within. Even the greatest of sinners, if they turn to me in true devotion, becomes one with me. As fuel thrown into the fire becomes fire, there is nothing in this world so purifying as wisdom, and they who are perfect saints find that at last in their own self. Hold spiritual wisdom as your highest goal, Arjuna. Make your faith deep, restrain your senses, then you will arrive at this wisdom quickly and achieve the perfect peace of divinity. The ignorant, uninformed about Atma and without faith, waste their lives. Through their disbelief, they alienate themselves from the self, and thus from true unity with others. As miserable people, they cannot be happy in this world or any world beyond. But the person who has renounced their action, offering it to the divine, who has cleaved their doubt in two by the sword of wisdom, who remains always enthroned in the Atma, the true self within, are not bound by their acts. Though they are ever occupied with action, karma cannot taint them. Therefore, cleaving asunder with the sword of wisdom the doubts of the heart, which your own ignorance has engendered, follow the path of self-knowledge and arise, O Prince. Chapter 5 Sanyasa Yoga Renunciation in Action Arjuna said, My Lord, at one moment you recommend the path of knowledge, or renunciation of action, and another the path of desireless, or right action. These seem to conflict. Which of these is definitely better for me? Lord Krishna replied, Renunciation of action and the path of right action both lead to the same goal, which is liberation, moksha. But karma yoga the action part is better for you, Arjuna, as it is for most people. Many spiritual seekers assume they should withdraw like a sannyasi, renunciate, and they may for a time be blessed with tranquility, but most often it is merely the ego masquerading as quietism, the person of selfless action who feels neither desire nor aversion and does not yearn for one thing nor loathe another is the true renunciate. The uninformed think these two parts, renunciation, sannyasa yoga, and action, karma yoga, lead to different results. But that is not true. Take either path to the very end and they meet. At that place, the contemplative seeker of knowledge greets the person of action and they are both equally free from the cycle of birth and death. The mind absorbed in the divine even while engaging in earthly activities gets purified. Purifying your mind means your sense of doership vanishes and God becomes the doer. It also means that you realize yourself as the Atma in all beings. They who work in devotion, who is a pure soul and who controls their mind and senses are dear to everyone and everyone is dear to them. Though always working, such a person is never entangled. As the lotus floating on the surface of muddy water stays untouched by the water, when all actions are offered to the divine and any yearning for the results are surrendered, you cannot be tainted. The steadily devoted soul attains eternal peace because they offer the results of all actions to me. Whereas a person who is not in union with the divine, who is impelled by selfish desire, becomes entangled in agitations and anxieties of the mind. Sages look equally upon all whether they be spiritually advanced or the least in the ranks, or even a cow or a dog. The real know of Brahman, the highest Godhead, sees only divinity everywhere, in every being and in everything. They are neither elated by good fortune, nor depressed by what is painful. They neither rejoice nor grieve. They know that the sensation called pleasure appears and disappears like a flash of lightning. And they know that the cost of pleasure is inevitably misery and pain. Earthly pleasures, though they seem enjoyable, are fleeting and ultimately painful. Desire and anger are counterparts. Anger is your reaction to unfulfilled desire. 
Those who actually experience divinity have severed the chains of selfish desire. Through constant, intense effort, they have taken charge of their minds and bodies, and are actually above desire, anger and greed. They now dwell in their true self, experiencing eternal bliss everywhere. The process for vanquishing the mind and senses consists of shutting out the external world, focusing one's gaze on the center of spiritual consciousness between the eyebrows, and gradually equalizing the ingoing and outgoing of breath. Then, with the body, mind, senses and intellect under control, without desire, fear and anger, realization of the Godhead comes. Ceaselessly think only of me, Arjuna. Know that I, the Godhead, Brahman, am the object of all worship and the receiver of all offerings. Know that I am the source of all and the friend of all. Knowing this, you come to the place where all parts meet and you achieve lasting peace. Chapter 6 Dhyana Yoga Controlling the Mind and Senses Krishna continues, The person who works in this world without needing or expecting reward is both a sannyasi, true renunciate, and karma yogi, action yogi. But the person who merely refrains from acting in this world is neither of these. You cannot just discard worldly duties. You must do them to the utmost extent of your human capacity for excellence. Arjuna, renunciation is in fact what is called right action. No person can become spiritual without renouncing all desire. Know that the self can be both friend and foe. A friend when used to conquer the mind, senses and body. A foe when it drags one into the mind, senses and body. True self, Atma, is the ally. The ego mind self is the enemy. The person who is self-controlled and has attained peace is equally unmoved by heat or cold, pleasure or pain, honor or disgrace. They who desire nothing but wisdom and spiritual insight, who have conquered their senses and who look upon with the same eye upon mud, stone or gold is the true yogi. To attain this godly state, Arjuna, you must become fully immersed in the true self through the process called meditation Dhyana Yoga. Having chosen a holy place, sit in a firm posture on a seat, neither too high or too low. While meditating, sit up straight, keep your body still, and keep your eyes from wandering by gazing at the tip of your nose. Or, close the eyes and focus on the center of spiritual consciousness between your eyebrows. Remain in perfect calmness with your thoughts fixed on me, the Divine. Through long concentration, one's mind seizes its wandering. After some time, one develops a new sensory faculty known as a melanoti, an intuitive penetrating skill that makes knotty issues of life no longer problems. The yogi with their mind constantly on the divine find deep serenity, the zenith of self-realization, and merges with me. Meditation is not for they who eat too much or too little, or for those who sleep too much or too little but for those who regulate their food and play, who is balanced in action, in sleep and in waking, it shall dispel all unhappiness. When the mind, completely controlled, is centered in the Atma within and free from all earthly desires, then that person is a true yogi. They who see me in everything and everything in me shall never be forsaken, nor shall they lose me. Arjuna interrupts, I do not see how I can attain the state of calmness which you speak of, Krishna. My mind is restless and stubborn. It is like trying to control the wind. Lord Krishna replied, You do know the nature of the mind, Arjuna. It is fickle and extremely difficult to restrain. But with practice and renunciation, it can be done. It is not possible to attain self-realization if a person does not know how to control themselves. But for they who are striving by proper means, learn such control, it is possible. Arjuna asks, They who fail, whose mind falls from spiritual contemplation, who does not attain perfection but retains their faith, what of them, my Lord? Lord Krishna replied, Spiritual work is never wasted. There is no destruction for them, either in this world or the next. No evil fate awaits they who tread the path of righteousness. Having reached the worlds where the righteous dwell, and having remained there for many years, they who have slipped from the path of spirituality 
will be born again in the family of the pure, benevolent, and prosperous. Or they may be born in a family of spiritually advanced, though a birth like this is indeed very difficult to obtain. Then the experience acquired in their former life will revive, and with its help they will strive for perfection more eagerly than before. Then, after many lives, the student of spirituality, who earnestly strives and whose sins are absolved, attains perfection and reaches the Supreme. The yogi moving towards divinity is deemed more highly evolved than ascetics who practice severe penance, higher than the learned ones who know the scriptures, and above the ritualists who perform their rites seeking favors. All of these are to some extent still entangled in desire. Know that the true yogi has chosen a great yet attainable ideal in life, to turn Godward, to constantly and consciously move towards divinity. Chapter 7 Jnana Vijnana Yoga Knowing and Experiencing Divinity Lord Krishna said, Listen Arjuna, and I will tell you how you shall know divinity, me, in full perfection. Practicing meditation with your mind devoted to me and having me for your refuge, for this, you will need both knowledge of divinity, jnana, and wisdom of divinity, vijnana. I will give these to you. One learns knowledge through the senses and mind. One gains wisdom through direct practice. Knowledge knows it at an intellectual level. Wisdom realizes it fully and is able to apply it in daily living. Once you combine both of these, there is nothing more you need to know in this world. Only one person in many thousands seeks full God-knowledge, and of these, only one in many thousands truly gains it. The rare ones who do attain this level of knowing become indistinguishable from divinity and thus achieve liberation. Know, Arjuna, that I have two aspects, a lower and a higher. My lower self is the realm of nature, Prakriti. This is comprised of eight basic components, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intellect, and ego. Beyond this world of nature, I have a second, higher aspect that is distinct from all nature and yet interacts with it. This is my spiritual realm, Purusha. Purusha is the life force, the source of consciousness in all beings, and animator of all life. This power supports and sustains the entire universe. All is strung upon me as rows of pearls upon a thread. Arjuna, I am the fluidity in water, the light in the sun and the moon. I am the mystic syllable Om in the Vedic scriptures, the sound in ether, the virility in man. I am the fragrance of earth, the brilliance of fire. I am the life force in all beings, and I am the austerity of the ascetics. Know, Arjuna, that I am the eternal seed of being, I am the intelligence of the intelligent, the splendor of the resplendent. I am the strength of the strong, and I am the desire for righteousness. All of nature consists of three characteristics called gunas. The first is goodness, sattva. The second is passionate activity, rajas. The third is darkness, indolence, or inertia, tamas. All of these come from nature, which is my lower nature. The three basic qualities of nature, goodness, passion, and darkness, are like three primary colors, which combine in an infinite number of ways to form all the hues in the universe. It all seems real, but as it is constantly changing, it is not real. Due to this Maya mentality, the illusion that the world is real, people do not look beyond the veil of illusion to me, the unchanging consciousness. This curtain of illusion, or Maya, is hard to see through Arjuna. Only those that love and depend completely on divinity are eventually able to do so. Those that are unable to see beyond the veil are not able to discriminate between real and not real. Ignorant of their own higher nature, they sink to their lower nature and do evil deeds, committing acts that turn them away from divinity. Four types of people seek a connection with me. 1. The world-weary. People who worship God for the alleviation of physical or mental agony. 2. The seekers of happiness through worldly things. People who pray to God to obtain wealth, family, power. 3. 
the seekers of spiritual advancement, people whose motive for connecting with divinity is to gain knowledge and experience to aid their self-realization. 4. The wise, people who know the Atma, Self, who know that God alone exists and whose impulse is for the divine and nothing else. Of these, the last is the highest, because they know my truth and are devoted to me. The first three are still attached to the worldly objects or mental states they desire. All four types are noble, because any reason for turning Godward will in due time lead to spiritual transformation, and is therefore ultimately good. The wise, however, stand foremost. As fuel thrown into the fire becomes fire, the wise, absorbed in me, becomes one with the Godhead. Others, hoping to fulfill worldly desires, drift to lesser gods and offer rituals and rites. It is quite easy to get to these limited deities, but the rewards are correspondingly small. True devotees of the Supreme Godhead give no thought to worldly things. And yet, Arjuna, whatever form of God people choose to worship in good faith, it is I, the Godhead, who makes their faith steady and unwavering. I do this to help them evolve stage by stage along their spiritual paths. People of little wisdom do not understand my supreme immutable existence, and they think of me only as a finite figure. I do not reveal myself to them. Very few can see through this veil of illusion called Maya that I hold in front of me. If individual souls do not know their own truth, Atma, how are they to know the truth of God, the cosmic soul? Know that I, the Godhead Brahman, the Adhyatma, preside over the entire cosmos, including the physical universes, Adibhuta, and the spirits who handle all sacrifices or offerings, Adiyatna. Those who make me their refuge, who strive for liberation from decay and death, they realize the Supreme Spirit, which is their own real self, Atma. And so they calmly accept death as a matter of course. Their God-realization is at its zenith when they drop their bodies. At that instant, their whole consciousness becomes one with my cosmic consciousness, and they are liberated from rebirth. Chapter 8 Akshara Brahma Yoga The Eternal Godhead Arjuna asked, My Lord, your words raise several questions in me. What is Brahman? What is Adhyatma? What is the essential nature of karma? What are the spirits or deities you refer to? Adibhuta, Adideva, Adiyagna, and how exactly are yogis united with the Godhead at the time of their death? Lord Krishna replied, You have asked seven questions, Arjuna. Time is running fast and the war waits, so listen carefully. Brahman, the Godhead, is my absolute highest nature, faster than whatever you call vast, omnipresent, imminent, everywhere, the imperishable, indestructible, undying, eternal, divine. Adhyatma, the term Atma, or Adhyatma in this case, is used to indicate the same vastness, the very earliest supreme Godhead existing in all individual beings. It cannot be known without great effort. The prefix Adi, meaning the beginning or first. Karma, here meaning action, refers in this context to my original vibrations, the initial actions that brought all of creation into existence and keeps it going. All beings are part of this karma. Adibhuta pertains to the earliest divinity that exists in the physical universe particularly in the elements and thoughts that comprise the individual. Adidaiva refers to the primordial divinity that dwells in the numerous lesser deities, who, as my agents, operate an individual's mind, body and senses. Example, the eye is illumined by Surya, the sun god, the hand by Indra, and so forth. Adiyagna refers to the earliest divinity in the act of giving the primordial spirit of selfless sacrifice that flows throughout creation. Regarding your final question, whoever remembers me at the time of death will come to me. That person's consciousness will merge into my cosmic consciousness. The sum total of your thoughts and feelings throughout your life condensed into a single state of mind at the time of departure from the body. You assume a particular mental makeup at the instant of your death. 
Whatever occupies your attention throughout life will inevitably be your consciousness at the time you die, and to that realm of consciousness you will go. Then, sometime later, that same mental structure is manifested back into the world. This is what's called the next birth. Throughout life, prepare for the death moment. The moment of death does not mean some future instance in time. It means this very moment, as any moment may be your last. So, treat each as your last, as your thought at that instant is the foundation on which your next birth is assembled. Live in a state of constant spiritual awareness. Do everything for God. Think of the divine every minute. Do your earthly duties well, but simultaneously be aware at every moment of the Godhead. Do your duty, Arjuna. Fight, but do it with your heart and mind fixed on me. Then you will surely come to me. Through constant practice called Abhyasa Yoga, living becomes a lifelong meditation on the divine. This becomes a habit of the mind. This is how one finds God and goes to God. At the time of death, one should close down the gates of the senses, place the mind in the shrine of the spiritual heart, focus all life force energy upwards to the center of consciousness between the eyebrows, and repeat the syllable Om, which represents me, Brahman, the Supreme Godhead. This is the very essence of my teachings. The way to merge with me, Brahman, is to constantly, steadfastly, relentlessly remember me, always, at every moment of your life. In this way, you are ever prepared for your end. Remember that one's death is not some future instance, it could be at any time. One's next birth depends on how one's death takes place. The point is, not to hope for a good birth, but to aim for a good death. Those great souls that have perfected their lives and come to me are no longer subject to rebirth into yet another lifetime. Avoid birth and you avoid death. Chapter 9 Raja Vidya Raja Guya Yoga Royal Knowledge and the King of Secrets Lord Krishna said, Since you are so receptive, Arjuna, I will now reveal to you the greatest and most profound of secrets. Having this knowledge, will liberate you from the sorrows of worldly existence. This is the royal road of ultimate knowledge, the king of secrets. It is easy to practice and a joy to behold. Once you know the secret, you cannot lose it. They who have no faith in this teaching cannot find me. To cynical people with trifling objection, this secret is a closed book. They are compelled to return to the cycle of death and rebirth. I, Brahman, the Supreme Godhead, in my unmanifested, invisible form, pervade everything and every creature in the universe. I am the origin of everything that is and is not. All beings in all the worlds exist in spirit within me and depend on me, yet I am in no way limited by them. All beings, Arjuna, return at the close of every cosmic cycle into the realm of nature, Prakriti, which is a part of me, and at the beginning of the next cosmic cycle, I send them forth again. Again and again, I pour forth the whole multitude of beings, but these acts of mine do not bind me. I remain outside and unattached. Under my guidance, nature produces all things. The cynical disregard me, seeing me clad in human form, unaware that in my higher nature, I am their very soul. Their ignorance makes their life fraught with pain and disaster. But the great souls, Arjuna, the Maha Atmas, filled with my divine spirit, they worship me, they fix their minds on me and on me alone. For they know that I am the imperishable source of being, the divine Atma present in all beings. I am the rites and rituals of the scriptures. I am the food that is medicinal and healing. I am the mantra. I am the fuel offered to the fire, I am the fire itself, and I am the act of offering. I am the father of the universe and its mother, I am its nourisher and its grandfather. As water gets purified by filtering through earth, mankind gets purified by contact with me. I am the syllable Om, the very sound of divinity. I am the destination and the journey. I am life and death, 
I am the fountain and the seed. I am the heat of the sun. I release and hold back the rains. I am death and immortality. Those who follow ritual and refrain from bad deeds, who offer worship and pray for heaven, eventually reach those heavenly plains. But when the merits they have earned in life are spent, they return to this world for yet another birth, debt, recycle. Caught by their own attachment to enjoyment, even the joy of heaven, they continue to come and go. Now listen carefully, Arjuna. This is the king of secrets, the crown jewel, the law of life at the spiritual level. If you think of me only, and constantly revere and worship me, with your mind and heart undistracted, I will personally carry the burden of your welfare. I will provide for your needs, and safeguard what has already been provided. I accept with joy whatever I am offered in true devotion. Fruit or water, leaf or flower, the gift is love, the dedication of your heart. Therefore, Arjuna, whatever you do in this world, whatever you eat, sacrifice, give up or give away, even your suffering, offer it all to me, dedicate everything to me, divinity. By offering all your actions to the divine, you surrender selfish attachment to their fruits. And this frees you from the karmic consequences of your actions, whether the consequences are pleasant or painful. With your mind unshakably on this path of renunciation, you will be united with me. I am equally present in all beings and show the same face to all creation. None are favored, none are hated, and none dear. But those who love me with brimming heart become absorbed in me. And as they dwell in me, I am revealed dwelling within them. Even the most sinful, if they turn to me with their whole heart, shall be considered righteous. Newfound dedication can quickly refashion one's nature. Know this for certain, no one devoted to me falls. Everyone who takes refuge in me, whatever their birth, gender or position in society, will attain the supreme goal of merging into me. Give all your love to me, adore me, the one divine. Make all your acts an offering, surrender to me, make divinity your fondest ideal and your highest goal. Set your heart and mind on me as I here prescribe and you will enter my very being. Chapter 10 Virbhuti Vistara Yoga Divine Splendor Lord Krishna said, Arjuna, they who know me as the unborn, without beginning, the Lord of the universe, stripped of delusion, become free of all misdeeds. I am in all living beings as the following qualities, intellect, patience, wisdom, peace of mind, self-restraint, control of ego, discrimination, equanimity, non-harm to others, austerity, self-discipline, and charitable giving. Knowing these divine virtues, you glimpse my divine powers. I am the source of all. From me, everything flows. Wise yogis worship me with unwavering devotion. To those who worship me with love, I give the power of discrimination, being able to tell the real from the not real, which leads them to me. By my grace, I live in their hearts, and I dispel the darkness of ignorance with the shining light of wisdom. Arjuna asked, O Krishna, tell me about your glorious manifestations by which you pervade the world. How shall I know you? Lord Krishna replied, Absorption in the attributes of the divine is as good as absorption in divinity itself. Because all the splendors of nature are attributes of my majesty, I will only give you a glimpse of a few. From this partial knowledge, you may infer my infinitude. Arjuna, I am the innermost true self, the Atma, seated in the heart of all beings, and I am the beginning, middle, and end of all beings. Of all the creative powers, I am the creator, of luminaries, the sun, the whirlwind among the wind, and of the lights of the night, I am the moon. Of the ancient scriptures, I am the foremost, the Sama Veda. Of the sense organs, I am the mind that records all sensations. Of the numerous levels of life awareness that exist in all life forms, I am pure consciousness. Of the eleven deities of destruction, I am Shiva, destroyer of evil in the mind, 
who brings humanity's lasting welfare. Of the eight elements in the structure of nature, I am fire, the one who brings warmth and life. Of all the bodies of water, I am the ocean into which the rest merge. Of sacrifices, I am the most potent, Japa, repetition of the name of the divine. Of all utterances, I am Om, the most sacred of sound symbols. And of fixed stationary things, I am the Himalayas. Of the trees, Arjuna, I am the holy fig tree, Ashvata, which represents the upside-down tree of life, with its roots above in spirit and its branches below in the earth. Of weapons, I am God's thunderbolt, which descends on the wickedness. Among instincts, I am the procreative urge. Of those who keep records, I am the unfailing reckoner, time itself. Of animals, I am the lion. Of birds, I am the Lord's eagle, Garuda. Of the four purifiers in nature, I am the wind, which purifies the other purifiers. Of those that wield deadly weapons, I am Rama, who uses these weapons only for the good of humanity. Of all fish, I am the shark, the most powerful. Among rivers, I am Ganges, with its sanctifying water. Of all things created, Arjuna, I am the beginning, the middle, and the end. Of all humanity's instruments for inquiry and debate, I am pure logic. Of time, I am the eternal present. I am all devouring death. I am the origin of all that shall happen. I am fame, fortune, speech, memory, intellect, constancy, and forgiveness. Even among deceitful practice, I am the roll of the dice. I am the splendor of the splendid. I am victory. I am effort, and I am the purity of the pure. I am Krishna among the Vishnu clan, and Arjuna among the Pandavas. I am the scepter of rulers, the strategy of the conquerors, the silence of mystery, the wisdom of the wise. I am the seed of all being, Arjuna. No creature, moving or unmoving, can live without me. There is no end to my divine manifestations. What I have described to you is a tiny glimpse into my glories. Know, Arjuna, that I exist, and that I hold the entire creation by a small fraction of my supreme glory. Chapter 11 Vishvarupa Darshana Yoga The Cosmic Vision Arjuna said, My Lord, your words have dispelled the illusions which surrounded me. I now long to have a vision of your divine form, if it is possible, and if I am worthy. Lord Krishna replied, you are worthy, Arjuna. I will have you see within me the many classes of celestial beings and more marvels not previously revealed. You will view all of creation and whatever else your inner thoughts may bring. But you cannot perceive any of this with mortal eyes. I now grant you divine vision to see beyond physical nature. Behold, Arjuna, my divine cosmic form. Having thus spoken, Lord Krishna showed to Arjuna the supreme form. There were countless eyes and mouths and mystic forms innumerable with shining ornaments and flaming celestial weapons. It is as if a thousand suns were suddenly blazing in the sky, and even that is insufficient tribute to the splendor and brilliance of his aura. In that vision, Arjuna saw the universe with its many shapes all embraced in one, its supreme lord. Arjuna, dumb with awe, his hair on end, addressed the lord, O Almighty Krishna, I see in you the powers of nature, the various creatures of the world, the progenitor on his lotus throne, the sages and the shining angels. I see you as infinite in form, with faces, eyes and limbs everywhere, no beginning, no middle, no end. O Lord of the universe, whose form is universal, I see you with the crown, the scepter and the discus, a blaze of splendor, glowing like a blazing fire, brilliant as the sun, I can barely look upon you, even with these divine eyes you have granted me. You are the immortal guardian of the life eternal, the spirit everlasting, without beginning, without middle and without end, infinite in power, flooding the whole universe with light. You alone fill all the quarters of the sky, earth and heaven, and the regions between. O Almighty Lord, seeing your marvelous and awe-inspiring form, the spheres tremble with fear. The troops of celestial beings enter into you, some invoking you in fear with folded palms. The great seers sing hymns to your glory. The vital forces, 
the major stars, fire, earth, air, sky, sun, heaven, moon and planets, the angels, the guardians of the universe, the divine healers, the winds, the fathers, the heavenly singers, sinners as well as saints are amazed. Seeing your form with its myriad faces, its innumerable eyes and limbs and terrible jaws, I myself am overwhelmed with awe. When I see you touching the heavens, glowing with color and open mouth and wide open fiery eyes, I am terrified, O Lord. My courage and peace of mind desert me. When I see your mouths with their fearful jaws like glowing fires at the dissolution of creation, I lose all sense of place. I find no peace. Be merciful, O Lord. I see all the sons of Jatrasha. I see Bhishma, Drona, and Karna. I see our warriors and all the kings who are here to fight. All are rushing into your awful jaws. I see some of them crushed by your teeth. As rivers flow into the ocean, all the warriors of this world are passing into your fiery jaws. All creatures rush to their destruction like moths into a flame. You lap the worlds into your burning mouths and swallow them. Filled with your terrible radiance, O Vishnu, the whole of creation bursts into flames. Tell me who you are, O Lord. I bow before you. Have mercy. I want to know who you are. You who existed before all creation. Your nature and working is confound me. Lord Krishna replied, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. All these warriors gathered for battle shall not escape death. Gather your courage, subdue your foes, and enjoy the kingdom in prosperity. Be my instrument, Arjuna. Drona, Bhishma, Kana, and other brave warriors. I have already condemned them all. Destroy them. Fight and do not be afraid. Your foes shall be crushed. Arjuna said, My lord, it is natural that the world revels and rejoices when it sings the praises of your glory. The demons fly in fear and the saints offer you their salutations. You are the primal god, the ancient, the supreme abode of this universe, the knower, the knowledge, and the final home. You fill everything, your form is infinite. You are the wind, death, fire, water, moon, father and grandfather of the universe. I give honor and glory to you a thousand and a thousand times. Your power is infinite, your majesty immeasurable. You uphold all things, O Lord. I am both overjoyed and overwhelmed with fear. Please take again the form I know. Be merciful, O Lord. I long to see you as you were before. Lord Krishna replied, My beloved friend, it is only through my grace and power that you have been able to see this vision of splendor, the universal, the infinite, the original. Never has it been seen by any but you. Not by study of the scriptures, not by sacrifice or gift, not by ritual or rigorous austerity is it possible for man on earth to see what you have seen. Be not afraid or bewildered by the terrible vision. Put away your fear and, with joyful mind, see me once again in my usual form. Arjuna said, Seeing you in your human form, my lord, I am myself again, calm once more. Lord Krishna replied, It is hard to see this vision of me that you have seen. Even the most powerful are longed for it in vain. Only by tireless devotion can I be seen and known. Only thus can a person become one with me, Arjuna. They whose every action is done for my sake, to whom I am the final goal, who loves me only and hates no one, only they can realize me. Chapter 12 Bhakti Yoga The Path of Love Arjuna asked, My Lord, there are those who worship you as Sagguna Brahman, God with a form, and those who worship you as Nikona Brahman, God without a form. Which of these is more pleasing to you? Lord Krishna replied, Either path is pleasing to me, Arjuna, but know that Niguna literally means not of nature. Those that worship me as Niguna Brahman face a steeper climb, as it is difficult for those who possess a human form to realize me as without one. Know, Arjuna, that I quickly come to those who offer me all their actions, who set their mind on me, with unswerving devotion, and take me as their one and only goal in life. I rescue them from the ocean of life and death. As a first part to liberation, fix your mind on me. Let your mind cling only to me. Let your intellect abide in me. And without doubt, you shall live hereafter in me alone. Although this may seem difficult, know that the seemingly impossible becomes possible through constant practice, Abhyasa Yoga. But if you cannot fix your mind firmly on me, 
Then follow the second path. Transform all your worldly actions into worship. Do them for my sake. Turn your force of habit to your own advantage. Make it a habit of devoting all your actions to divinity and you shall still attain the goal. And if you are unable to do even this, then follow this third path to seek refuge in me. Give up the desire for the fruits of your action. Why? Because peace immediately follows the giving up of selfish desires. Know that knowledge is superior to blind rituals. Meditation is superior to mere knowledge and renunciation of the fruits of action is superior to meditation. Arjuna, I shall now enumerate the qualities of the devotee that is most dear to me. I love those who are incapable of hatred towards any being, who is kind and compassionate, free from selfishness without pride, unperturbed by pain and not elated by pleasure, forgiving, always contented, self-controlled, resolute, with mind and reason dedicated to me, such a devotee is my beloved. They who are neither a source of agitation in the world or agitated by the world, who is not carried away by impulse of joy, anger or fear, such a one is my beloved. They who expect nothing, who is pure, watchful, indifferent, unruffled and who renounces all fruits of labor, such a one is my beloved. They who are beyond joy and hate, who neither lament nor desire, those who accept the knocks of life as blessings in disguise, such a one is my beloved. They who treat friend and foe alike, equal-minded in honor and dishonor, heat and cold, pleasure and pain, who is wanting of nothing, who is indifferent to praise and blame, who enjoys silence, unaffected by the good or bad things that happen around them, who is steadfast in mind and filled with devotion, such a one is my beloved. Those who practice the spiritual wisdom as I have taught, steadfast in their faith, and who concentrate their whole being on me, will go beyond life and death to immortality. Chapter 13 Shetra Shetranya Vabhaga Yoga The Field and the Know of the Field Arjuna asked, My Lord, if divinity is everything in the world, then what is the difference between the world and divinity? How does one distinguish between the body and the soul? What is the difference between physical matter and the world of spirit? And is there any value in knowing all of this? Lord Krishna replied, Arjuna, when you know the true nature of the material world, your grief is destroyed. And when you understand the true nature of spirit, bliss is acquired. The term field refers to one's physical body and everything else in the material world. The know of the field refers to the intelligence that resides in, but is not really a part of the body and all matter. It is also referred to as soul or atma. Arjuna, I am the know of the field. I am that indweller in every body and everything. The ability to discriminate between the field and its knower is the utmost highest knowledge. Arjuna, I will now explain what the field, the world of nature, called Prakriti, consists of, where it came from, and why and how it operates. All of Prakriti comes from the Supreme Consciousness, Divinity. Prakriti, the field, is made up of 25 components. First, the unmanifested, Mahat, the first glimmer of an ego force in the cosmos. From this comes the higher mind, intellect, Bodhi the ability to distinguish between the real and not real. Next comes the ego, the awareness of oneself as an apparently separate identity. From the ego is produced the lower mind, manas, which processes the senses of the body. Next, the five cognitive senses, hearing, touching, seeing, tasting, smelling. And the five active instruments, speaking, holding, moving, procreating, eliminating. Then, the five objects of the senses, sound, tactility, appearance, taste, smell. Lastly produced, the five basic elements, earth, water, fire, air and space. And most importantly, Atma, the life force of all elements. This makes up the total 25. Arjuna, I will now explain the qualities of the knower of the field. This knowledge is beyond intellectual knowing. 
It comes not through intellect, but through possessing these distinctive virtues and outlooks that, taken together, give rise to such knowing. The knower of the field is humble. Be like this knower. Know in your heart that all excellence emanates only from the divine. Be gentle. Be forgiving of any hurt received. Be upright and harmonized in thought, word and deed. Be steadfast in your spiritual development. Be pure of mind. Purity is indispensable to your spiritual growth. Be ever in control of your body, mind and senses. Be detached from egoism, selfishness and attractions of the world. Do not see yourself as this body-mind complex. Know instead that you are Atma, the eternal reality. Meet the good and bad of life with an even mind. To no one or no thing be a slave, Arjuna. Be tied neither to possessions nor to family. Love and fulfill your responsibilities to spouse, children, home and kin. But do not become so identified with them that you forget Atma, your true self within. The way to do all of this is through loving me with your heart undistracted. Be ever intent on divinity. Center all your thoughts on me. Prefer for now the company of like-minded persons, and then, as you advance, sever even from them, but not as a hermit, as a detached yogi. Grow in wisdom through diligent inquiry into the nature of self and non-self. Only divinity is truth, Arjuna, and Atma is truly divinity. This is true knowledge. To seek anything else is to seek ignorance. The goal of spiritual wisdom is to realize, that is, to know in your heart the Supreme Godhead, that which is both being and non-being, both manifested and unmanifested. To the ignorant, the Godhead is distant. To knowledgeable people, the Godhead is very near. It appears to be many, but it is one, undivided. The Godhead, Brahman, dwells in each and every heart, beyond the darkness of ignorance. It is the true self within. It is the sole goal of knowledge, and it is knowledge itself. Devoted people who grow to understand this profound truth are worthy to be united with me. Know that all of physical nature evolves from consciousness, and know that all of nature are permutation and combinations of the three guna qualities, calm goodness, sattva, passionate action, rajas, and dark lethargy, tamas. The cause of your body is nature, but the cause of your aliveness, that is, your experience of being an individual, is spirit. This spirit self, the jiva, takes residence in a material body and forgets its true nature, which is atma, and mistakenly identifies itself with that body. Thus, it becomes attached to nature, to the gunas. While the individual is a mixture of all three guna qualities, the one to which it is most attached dominates, and the individual becomes that type of person. Example, becoming a generally calm or sattvic person, or an active rajasic person, or a lethargic tamasic person. As the individual is now a part of nature, it is bound to participate in repeated births and deaths. And yet, remember Arjuna, that the spirit dwelling in the individual body as Atma is truly Brahman, the Godhead. When you have directly experienced the Godhead, Brahman, you will not be born again, because then you will truly know that the Divine One is beyond all this natural world of Prakriti and Gunas. The fire of this great knowledge will burn out all your karmas, and there will be no more motivating force within you to create another birth. Thus unburdened, you in the state called Jivan Mukti will duly perform all your duties in the world and yet watch life in total peace. The paths to this great knowledge are several. Some realize it through building mind power through meditation, dhyana yoga. Others do it by sharpening the intellect through acquisition of knowledge, jnana yoga. And yet others through performing selfless action, karma yoga. Whatever the path, if successfully walked, it eventually develops pure single-minded love for God, bhakti yoga, union with God through devotion. When one reaches this level of absolute divine love, one reaches the end. For those unable to grasp any of these parts, there is yet another way. By diligently and faithfully listening to their spiritual teachers and worshipping the divine as instructed, they too will eventually pass beyond the wheel of birth and death. Remember that whatever comes into existence, whether thing or being, is a result of the union between matter and spirit, the field and the knower. 
When the matter part of this union falls in death, the spirit part remains standing. Ordinary people do not see the spirit within, and therefore think that it is their own self that dies. Only when you see the undying within the dying do you really see the truth. Indeed, true seers, perceiving divinity in everyone, do no harm to anyone. The ones that don't perceive this unity separate themselves from others, seeing some as friends and others as foes. These are the ones that do the harm. It is this delusion of separateness that causes all evils perpetrated by humanity. How can one who really knows Atma injure the same Atma in another? You must ultimately realize this tremendous lesson. All creatures, although appearing separate, are truly only one. All beings emanate from the Godhead and are united in the Godhead. The one who truly learns this becomes the Godhead and thereby that one attains liberation. The true self, Atma, has no beginning or end. It is never tainted, even though it dwells in every creature. Just as the single sun illuminates the whole world, the soul know of the field lights up the entire field. Finally, Arjuna, know that the goal is not to get entangled in the world, but to use the world to reach divinity. Use your eye of wisdom, your intuitive faculty to distinguish between the field and the knower. Then you can actually cut yourself free from the field, from bondage to the worldly, and reach me, the supreme goal. Chapter 14 Gunatraya Vabhaga Yoga Going Beyond the Three Forces of Nature Lord Krishna continued, Arjuna, I will now reveal to you the very nature of nature, Prakriti. But knowing the secret, the great sages reached supreme perfection and were freed from the cycle of death and rebirth. Everything that is born is a result of a union between spirit, Purusha, and nature, Prakriti, and is the combination of three strands of nature called the Gunas, Sattva, calm goodness, Rajas, passionate activity, and Tamas, dark ignorance. All people have all three of these forces within them in different proportions and will exhibit the nature of their predominating guna. The sattvic person will be calm and harmonized. Rajasic people are full of restless energy. Tamasic persons will be lethargic, unmotivated, and unwilling to act. Gunas are forces that weave together to form a strong rope that binds the atma, soul, to one's worldly body and thus binds it to the cycle of death and rebirth. The objective of life is to reshape one's life upward in search of a higher ideal, changing from indolence, tamas, to passionate activity, rajas, and then channeling that into calmness, sattva. Of these, sattva, being pure, provides an unobstructed view of atma. But even here, a problem can arise when one finds pleasure in sacred knowledge and begins yearning for it. Any pleasure, even good pleasure, creates attachment and subsequently creates desire. All attachments, even golden ropes, binds the individual, the jiva, to the pain and the sadness of the material world. Desire-filled action is the very nature of rajas, the second guna. Desire goads one into action and creates a sense of doership in the mind. It creates a thirst for acquiring and clinging to worldly things, to people and sensations that attract the senses. Rajas breeds attachment to action and its fruit. This attachment, turned on itself, brings greed and greed's close relative, anger. Tamas, the third guna, which literally means darkness, instills nothing but indolence and stupor. This guna bewilders people, stealing their capacity for work, their rajasic energy, as well as taking their composure, their sattvic calmness. Sattva ties the pure person to joy, Rajas binds the active doer to incessant activity, and Tamas fastens indolent people to delusion and sloth. Over the course of a day, all three gunas ebb and flow within each person. Sattva rises to the fore by overpowering Rajas and Tamas. Rajas rules when Sattva and Tamas are weak. Tamas prevails when the other two qualities lie dormant and yield to lethargy. One should always be aware of when each guna dominates. When sattva rises, it is as though the light of the true self shines. Your seeing, thinking and action is more precise. When rajas takes over, it is as though impatience, greed and longing have sprung to the forefront. 
as if your own restlessness is compelling you to action. And you know that Thomas has taken charge when your mind feels lazy, bewildered and uncaring. The particular state of mind uppermost at the time of your death is the deciding factor of your next birth. Those who die in a sattvic state go to the pure heavens, the dwelling place of those who know the divine. If you die in a rajasic state, full of unfulfilled desires, excitement, fears and sorrows, you are reborn into the wombs of people similarly driven. If you die in a tamasic mentality, you depart in an unconscious state, only to be reborn into a situation of equal dullness and ignorance, or even a subhuman or animal. Always seek to move to the next higher level, from tamas to rajas to sattva. The anger and pain of the driven rajasic person may be heaven sent, because nothing motivates a person to mend their ways as much as the misery that always accompanies desire-driven action. Suffering is the training ground where one shapes good character and right conduct, dharma. It is dharma living a truth-based life that lifts one to the serenity of sattva. Those that live in sattva rise upward, whether in this world or the next. Those stuck in rajas stay in the middle, ever caught up in earthly activity. Those mired in tamas sink even lower. Remember that the gunas are nature, prakriti. The purpose of life is to outgrow the two inferior guna forces, to reach the serenity of sattva, and then to ascend even beyond sattva. The person who climbs beyond all three guna states is in essence transcending nature itself. This person enters the realm of pure consciousness and attains the supreme bliss of my being. This enlightened one feels no attraction or aversion to any of the gunas. No desire even for the calm goodness of sattva or the excitement of rajas and no repulsion towards the lethargy of tamas. They have nothing to gain by adhering to any of these earthly behaviors. They have nothing to lose by turning from them. As they do not tie their moods to worldly guna created circumstances, they cease being uplifted or depressed by their own likes or dislikes. Thus balanced in the face of pleasure and pain, these wise yogis are no longer party to the machinations of the three forces within nature and their body. They dwell always within self, Atma. Duality such as pleasure and pain, praise and blame no longer have any meaning to them as they are established in the attitude of holy indifference. To them, lumps of clay, stone or gold are all the same. They have progressed beyond time, space and circumstances to the place where the mind is tranquil and the ego disappears. The way to transverse the worldly forces, the gunas, is through steadfast practice of the three parts, the three yogas, I have prescribed. 1. Be thoroughly devoted to the divine, bhakti yoga. 2. Faithfully serve divinity, karma yoga, and 3. Be constantly aware of the same divinity in all others and in everything you do, yana yoga. Finally, Arjuna, be always aware that I, the Divine One, am the foundation of both the manifested and unmanifested Godhead. I am the imperishable, immutable Brahman above all, who dwells within all as Atma. I am eternal truth and everlasting bliss. Chapter 15 Purushottama Yoga Devotion to the Supreme Self Lord Krishna continued, Prakriti, the world of nature, can be compared to the mythical Ashvata tree, the giant upside-down tree with its roots high in God and its branches stuck in the mud of the earth. The branches stuck below are the earthly attachments that bind the individual soul, the jiva, to earthly existence. To understand the nature of this tree is to know the inverted way that humans see life. Know that the branches stuck in the mud must be cut with the axe of non-attachment. When you sever these attachments, an attitude of sacred dispassion comes, which is the prerequisite for spiritual wisdom. Then, spiritual intuition supplants your usual world seeing, and your whole vision of the universe undergoes a dramatic change. But cutting the root bonds is not enough. After the axe has done its work, you must seek the supreme goal of life, liberation from the cycle of rebirth. Non-deluded people who cleave off their ignorance, their unawareness of Atma, reach the supreme goal. When they are free of pride and they have slashed their attachments, when they have dropped their craving for pleasure and their aversion to pain, then these clear-seeking ones enter the light of the supreme goal. 
Once this enlightened soul has reached the supreme goal, they are forever with me and never restored to a separate existence. Arjuna, I will now explain more about the individual soul called the Jiva. The Atma, which is a part of divinity, enters into a body in the womb before birth. Thus it enters the world of matter. It draws around itself the five senses, with the mind as the sixth. The mind and senses are Prakriti, a part of nature. Like a breeze carrying the scent of perfume, the Atma, when it migrates from one body to the next, carries with it the mind and the senses. That means it brings along the intellect, the ego, the sense of being a separate identity, and the lower mind, transferring thoughts and tendencies from previous lifetimes. The individual soul, now called Jiva Atma, because it has drawn the senses around itself, experiences the desires, the pleasures and the pains of the world. People who are unaware of the true self within, Atma, do not recognize this Jiva in them that is using the senses. As the senses are limited to the mind level, these people are incapable of comprehending Atma which is above the mind. Yogis, however, possessing the eye of wisdom or intuitive faculty, do see me, their Atmic self within. To obtain this eye of wisdom, you must do two things. One, surrender your ego. And two, purify your mind. Only by accomplishing both of these will you behold me. Those with only half-hearted surrender or only partially purified minds are not granted the capacity to see their Atmic self. I enter the bodies of living beings as the warmth of life. From me comes knowledge, understanding and memory. It is I whom all the different scriptures of the world refer to, and it is I that altered them. As I transcend both the perishable and the imperishable, I am known in this aspect of myself as the Supreme Absolute Highest Self called the Purushatama. There is only one reality, Arjuna. Those who know and see the supreme level of self in me know and see the truth. These enlightened souls devote themselves to me with full hearts. I have revealed this most profound of truths to you. The one who grasps this great secret will become enlightened. All duties and missions in life and the goal of millions of years of evolution will have been achieved. There is no higher knowledge. That person has done what has to be done. Chapter 16 Daivashra Sampa Vabhaga Yoga the divine and the demonic part. Lord Krishna continued, Arjuna, I will now describe the qualities of people with divine tendencies and those with degenerate or demonic tendencies. First, these are the divine traits. Fearlessness, purity, steadfastness, charity, control of senses, sacrifice, study of scriptures, austerity, straightforwardness, non-injury, truthfulness, absence of anger, renunciation, calmness, not slandering, compassion, not coveting, gentleness, modesty, not fickle, vigor, forgiveness, fortitude, cleanliness, no hatred, no pride. All of these are the cardinal virtues that reveal the true nature of human beings, their divinity. On the other hand are the six degenerate or demonic qualities, behavior or moods that render a person less than human. Pride, pompousness, vanity, anger, harshness, absence of discrimination between right and wrong. The divine behaviors on the longer list lead to liberation. The degenerate behaviors lead to more time on the wheel of death and rebirth. Do not be concerned, Arjuna. You have brought divine qualities into this lifetime. Look more closely at degenerate behaviors, not to dwell on negatives, but to guard against them. Degenerate beings, because they have no sense of right conduct, dharma, do not know what they should do or not do. There is no purity in them. If asked why they carry on in such a detestable way, they argue that the scriptures are a lie, that God is dead or never existed, that the universe is a dog-eat-dog -dog place with no moral foundation. They contend that what exists in the world is merely an outcome of lust or just an accident. Holding this distorted viewpoint in their minds, they become enemies of the world 
and serve a negative purpose. Without thinking of the consequences of their actions, they cause destruction and suffering. If left alone to their self-indulgence, they would heedlessly destroy the world. Stuffed with endless, insatiable desires, they are arrogant, vain, and prideful. They live in delusion and chase blindly after evil, after those things that lead to suffering. They are blindly certain that gratifying their own lust is all there is to life. They are bound on all sides by scheming, greed and anger, because being hurtful themselves, they attract hurtful people to themselves. They amass and hoard wealth for the sole purpose of indulging senses and whims. Grabbing for riches and power governs their every thought and move. Self-conceited, stubborn, rich, proud and insolent, they make a display of their patronage. Puffed up by power and conceit, swayed by lust and wrath, these wicked people hate me who is within them as I am within all. They spiral downward into the painful hell of their own foul minds. Stuffed until choking with pride and conceit, drunk with their own wealth, they make lavish offerings to the gods only for show and fame. I condemn them to continuous, miserable and godless rebirth according to their karma. So reborn, they spend life after life enveloped in delusion and they never reach me, but degenerate into still lower forms of life. The main causes of this depravity are the so-called three gates to hell, desire, greed and anger. Any one of them is enough to bind you to this darkness, so abandon all three. Those who finally pass these three dark gates and turn to divinity do eventually reach me, the supreme goal. In fact, progress can be rapid once the degenerate person turns their aggressive energy towards me and takes the divine way. The function of the scriptures is to guide people towards living a perfected life on earth and repeatedly reminding them of the goal, which should be nothing short of achieving divinity itself. Let the scriptures tell you what you should and should not do. Know what the right choices are and live up to them. It is simpler than you think. When you are firmly on the path to enlightenment, there is no conflict at all between what you do and what the scriptures advise. Chapter 17 Shraddhatreya Vabhaga Yoga The Three Kinds of Faith Arjuna asked, My Lord, there are those that have faith but no elaborate knowledge of the scriptures. What would be their fate in life? Is the nature of their faith purity, sattva, passion, rajas, or ignorance, tamas? Lord Krishna replied, People are the sum total of the beliefs they hold in their heart. There are indeed various kinds of faith, and one's faith corresponds to one's nature. Each person has one of the three guna qualities as their dominant trait, sattva, rajas, or tamas. The individual's faith conforms to their dominant trait. Those of sattvic nature revered the gods in heaven. Rajasic people worship power and wealth, even though they may not acknowledge those as their gods. Tamasic people worship spirits of the dead, ghosts and hurtful deities, those with negative qualities and those that do harm. They are those that perform severe acts of penance that harm the body and senses and outrage me, the Atma within. They may seem to be of faith, but know that such acts are harmful to one's spiritual progress. There are other matters that bear in one's spiritual faith. One's eating habits play a part in it, a fact that few recognize and the way in which one performs the three main spiritual disciplines 1. Sacrifice, yagna or offering up 2. Purification, tapas or austerity and 3. Charity, dhyana or almsgiving These also influence one's spiritual development Food You are what you eat and you eat based on what you are Sattvic people consume pure, mild and nourishing foods that strengthens them physically and brings pure thoughts and mental cheerfulness. Their foods are fresh, juicy, soothing and agreeable to the body's digestive system. Rajasic people are drawn to spicy, hot, bitter, salty, acidic and burning food. Like the people that consume them, this food produces pain, grief and disease and hinders spiritual attainment. 
Tomastic people are drawn to old, overcooked, stale, impure, empty and dead foods with no nutritional value. This food returns these qualities in kind to the eater. The three types of spiritual discipline. Now Arjuna, pay attention to the three types of spiritual discipline. Sacrifice, purification and charity with regards to the guna qualities. First, sacrifice. Yagna, the loving offering, is sattvic when it is offered as a sense of duty with no desire for reward or attachment to the fruits of the offering. Sacrifice, which is performed for the sake of its results, the benefit it will bring, or for self-glorification, is rajasic. Tamasic people offer empty sacrifice, devoid of solemnity or faith. Next, purification or tapas. The goal of purification is not punishment but refinement, to shift from human existence to divinity. There are three main methods of purification. One, the refinement of one's thoughts. Two, the refinement of one's words. Three, the refinement of one's actions. When you modify these three, you automatically change for the better. Purifying one's actions or deeds consists of veneration of God and the spiritual master, respect for the preacher and the sages, purity, righteousness, self-restraint and gentleness. All of this is physical austerity or refinement of action. Purifying one's words consists of speech that harms no one, that is of truth, words that are presented in a way that is pleasant to listen to, speech that is beneficial to one's spiritual growth, and words of devotional chanting. Do not hurt others through harsh words, Arjuna. Words can be more painful than physical violence, and the hurt lasts longer. Lastly, the purification of thought, mind austerity. This is more important than the other two refinements, words and deeds, because good words and deeds are spontaneous in the mind that is saturated with good thoughts. Serenity, kindness, silence, self-control and purity. This is austerity of mind. This may seem impossible to achieve for most, but know that the seemingly impossible does become possible through constant, intense, direct practice. When you perform these three acts of purification with faith and with no expectation of reward, then your actions are sattvic. Acts of purification, coupled with hypocrisy, or performed for the sake of self-glorification, popularity or vanity is rajasic. Any act of purification to expect a reward in this world or the next makes the act rajasic and this extinguishes its value for spiritual attainment. When you perform these acts of purification without understanding the reason for doing them, under delusion and accompanied with torture to oneself or another, these acts are tamasic. Now Arjuna, consider the three types of charity or almsgiving. Charity offered out of a positive sense of duty, with no obligation and no expectation of reward, given at the right time and place to a deserving person who can make no return, that giving is sattvic. Charity that is given with strings attached, with desire for receiving a return either here or the hereafter, or grudgingly, is rajasic. And finally, charity that is given to people of questionable character, people that squander their money or do not help others, or gifts that are presented disrespectfully or accompanied by an insult, these charities are tamasic. Although all of these spiritual disciplines, sacrifice, purification and charity are the most elevating practices in the world, know that they all have a tinge of worldly impurity in them. Even the best sattvic practices of them do. To cleanse this practice, invoke the declaration Om Tat Sat as you undertake them. Each syllable, Om, Tat, Sat, represents the Supreme Consciousness from which everything comes. This ancient three-word phrase essentially means, God alone is the reality. Finally, Arjuna, know that faith comes first. These spiritual activities must be done with Shraddha, faith so firm that it contains determination, zeal, and momentum for spiritual growth. Chapter 18 Moksha Sanyasa Yoga Liberation through knowing, acting, and loving Arjuna asked, Dear Krishna, 
What is the difference between sannyasa and tiaga? Lord Krishna replied, The relinquishment of actions prompted by desire the sages understand as sannyasa. The relinquishment of the fruits of all action the wise declare to be tiaga. Both terms, sannyasa and tiaga, mean renunciation. Renunciation is not a negative process, but rather the positive act of giving up. There are examples of this in nature, the sun giving up its heat and light, the clouds giving up its life-giving rain, and grandest of all, the individual soul abandoning worldly entanglements to join me, the divine. While some sages say that all actions should be given up, since they all have a tinge of the impure in them, know that acts of sacrifice, purification and charity should never be given up, for they purify the aspiring soul. Purification is essential for moving Godward, which is the ultimate goal of life. Those who through ignorance do not perform these three highest actions are tamasic. To avoid these sacred duties out of fear or aversion to physical discomfort is rajasic. No spiritual benefit will accrue to that person. But when one engages in these activities for duty's sake alone, without attachment, with no desire for any reward, then the action is sattvic. Calmness and purity are born of this attitude. Sattvic people, not plagued by doubt, and aware of the true self, Atma within, do not shrink from action because it brings pain, nor do they desire it because it brings pleasure. It is impossible for a human being to be a full renunciate, to give up all action, but the person who detaches from the fruits of action can be regarded as a true renunciate. True renunciation is giving up all desire for personal reward. Those still attached who do things for selfish purposes will reap their rewards in due season, either here or hereafter. Their accrued karma can be bad, good or mixed, depending on their action. Being hurled into darkness to be reborn as a beast is an example of a reward for evil action. Being born as a celestial being in heaven is an example of a reward for good action. Being born as a human is a mixed reward. But those who have renounced desire and attachment reap no consequences whatsoever of their actions in this world or the next. Now Arjuna, I will explain the five factors that contribute to every action. 1. The body. There can be no action without it. 2. The doer of the action. 3. The various senses. 4. The effort. The emotion or energy involved in the doing. And 5. The presiding deity manipulating all these instruments, including the unseen destiny, the effect of past and present karma, paradha. These five factors are involved in all human activity, whether in action of thought, word or deed, and whether the action is right, dharmic, or wrong, adharmic. People commonly believe that the self, Atma, is the doer of action. But Atma has nothing to do with any of the five factors of action. The Atma performs no acts, no work at all, is eternal and pure, wholly unattached to the world of matter, Prakriti, where all action takes place. The sense of doership belongs to the ego, the mistaken sense rooted in the mind that you are an entity separate from Atma. Spiritually involved people understand the true self within. To them, worldly activities, such as in your case, killing or being killed, are modifications of Prakriti, the realm of nature. Nature is really the doer of all actions. As they are firmly aware of this, yogis rise above the turmoil and bondage of karma. Now Arjuna, I will explain how the forces of nature, the gunas, interact with the three elements of action. 1. Knowledge 2. Action and 3. The doer this interaction creates three types of knowledge, three types of action, and three types of doers. The person of sattvic knowledge knows the divinity of the self, sees divinity in all beings, knows the oneness of all creatures in the universe, and sees none of the separateness that others see. The person of rajasic knowledge perceives separateness everywhere and sees each individual as distinct from all others. He or she believes that they are as many separate souls as they are bodies. The person of tamasic knowledge has in reality no knowledge at all, only ignorance. 
This person believes the loss of the body means the loss of everything. There is no subtlety of reason. Now consider the three kinds of action. Sattvic actions are in alignment with the scriptures and performed without attachment. These actions are done for duty's sake alone, not for pleasure or personal reward. There is no drudgery in sattvic work. Work, action, is rajasic when goaded by desire for the fruits of that action. Rajasic work entangles one in self-indulgent pursuits and requires large amounts of egoistic effort. This type of action hinders spiritual growth and yields sorrow. Actions are tamasic when undertaken blindly, without thinking or considering consequences. No thought is given to the merit of doing the action, and the doer has no notion of their capacity to accomplish it. Consider now the three types of doers. Sattvic doers see it all as the work of the divine and see themselves as but instruments of divinity. Thus, completely egoless, these doers are free of desire and attachment. They are ardent about the work to be done and yet unaffected by success or failure. Rajasic doers are driven by desire for personal gain. They are greedy and destructive to the point of cruelty and joyous or despondent depending on the success or failure of their acts. Tamasic doers are inattentive, unconcerned, lethargic and lazy. Indolence and procrastination are their main features, along with deceitfulness, maliciousness and dishonesty. Also consider, from the perspective of the gunas, two additional qualities, intellect and firmness of mind. Intellect refers to the faculty of discrimination, buddhi. Firmness of mind, dirty, refers to the strength of conviction and courage on the spiritual path. Listen now as I describe the levels of intellect and then the levels of firmness. Sattvic intellect, buddhi, discriminates between truth and non-truth, real and not real. It knows the difference between action, karma, and inaction, a karma, and knows what helps or hinders spiritual progress. The sattvic intellect leads one Godward. The rajasic intellect also discriminates, but wrongly. It has a distorted understanding of right and wrong, rationalizing that the ends justify the means, no matter how selfish or hurtful. Greed, passion, anger, and fear cloud its vision. It stays mired in base, worldly life, instead of guiding one upward. The tamasic intellect, wrapped in ignorance and enveloped in darkness, simply cannot discriminate. Goodness appears bad, while evil seems good. It understands life in a perverted way. The tamas-dominated intellect drags one ever downward. Now consider the three degrees of firmness of mind, dirty. Sattvic firmness is an absolute unwavering devotion to the divine. A deeply profound resolve to move toward and merge in God. Rajasic firmness of mind is similarly resolute, but holds fast to the desires for pomp, power, property and prestige, or even to the attachment of virtuous living. If turned Godward, this resolve could lift you towards the Supreme, but directed towards worldly enjoyment, it condemns you to repeated lifetimes of turmoil and pain. Tamasic firmness is born of ignorance, lack of purpose and lack of fortitude. In the absence of discrimination or understanding, the only resolve in tamas is to eat, drink and sleep away one's time. We can also understand happiness in terms of the three gunas. Many people search for happiness in life, but few find it. The true happiness I speak of here comes only after long dedicated practice. Those who achieve this happiness end all sorrow in life. Listen Arjuna to the three classifications of happiness. Sattvic happiness is the serenity of mind that meditation brings, the sweet joy that comes with self-realization. Like all things good, it is hard work at the beginning, but sheer joy later. That is, bitter poison at first, but sweet nectar in the end. You find this joy inside, through abhyasa, steady practice. Rajasic happiness is just the opposite. Nectar at first, but poison in the end. It is temporary pleasure obtained from the contact of your senses with objects in the world. Give in to this happiness and you invite the pain that always accompanies it. Tamasic happiness is a non-comprehending sleep-like existence, but at both the beginning and the end. The only pleasure in this existence is the meager satisfaction of sleep, 
or the perverse enjoyment that comes with idle pursuits or neglect of duty. There is nothing anywhere on earth or in the higher world which is free from the three gunas, for they are born of nature, Prakriti. Even Brahma, not Brahman, Brahma, the creator, is not truly liberated because his action of creating takes place through the guna material of nature, which connects him to nature. So, from Brahma on down to a blade of grass, all living things are connected with Prakriti. Prescribed Duties in Society Arjuna I have mentioned the importance of doing one's duty. Now I will describe the nature of prescribed duties. The responsibilities of people in the various segments of society can be divided into four general headings. Seers, leaders, providers and servers. No particular group of people is superior to any other, but like limbs of the body, each has a respective role to play and function together for the harmonious working of society. These groupings are generally consistent with the conditioning of the individual's dominant guna, whether that conditioning is from this lifetime or previous lifetimes. Society's seers are the holy ones, in some societies referred to as Brahmins. Seers establish the moral character and spiritual underpinning of society. Their duties are generally of pure unmixed sattva and are therefore congenial to a person of sattvic nature. The primary purpose of seers is to help transform society's exemplary human beings into godly beings. The primary purpose of society's leaders, referred to as kshatriyas, is to help transform ordinary human beings into exemplary human beings. They are expected to guard the welfare and prosperity of society by serving the people. They must lead by inspiring people through a good example and yet be ready to enforce their authority. Society's providers and servers are, respectively, the business people, referred to as Vaishyas, and the workers, referred to as Shudras. The combined responsibilities of these two groupings are to prepare, supply, and equip society with the goods and services it needs. Providers are charged with the activities of economics and commerce, such as growing food. Servers are foundation. They provide the strength and sinew of society. Although there are different expectations of the four groups, remember that the practices conducive to spiritual growth are within the competencies of all people in all groupings of society. Achieving the Godhead All humanity is born for ultimately achieving perfection. Through being devoted to one's duties, each person will find this perfection. The person who bores his or her duty will never become fulfilled. Through doing work selflessly, with no attachment to the outcome, and doing it as an act of devotion to the divine, you attain fulfillment and spiritual perfection. Convert your earthly existence into worship. The one who does this is truly a yogi. Your nature dictates that you perform the duties attuned to your disposition. Those duties are your dharma, your natural calling. One should not abandon one's duties, even though they may seem tainted. True yogis perform their duties faithfully as acts of devotion to the divine and thus free themselves of any contamination. Achieving Perfection Arjuna, I will now briefly profile the qualities that make the loving yogi one with me, Brahman, the Godhead. There is no higher achievement in life. Free your mind and heart of delusion. Be self-restrained. Give up the ego. Subdue your senses through steady will. Put aside the likes and dislikes so burdensome in life. Seek solitude. Eat but little. Lead a simple, self-reliant life, curbing your thoughts, speech, and actions. Be detached, impersonal. Engage your mind always in concentration, contemplation, and meditation on the Godhead. Cast from yourself all egotism, violence, arrogance, desire, anger, and attachment. Turn your back on luxuries and property. Possess very little, and shed any sense of mind. Be calm, at peace with yourself and all others. Thus united with me, tranquil of mind and heart, neither craving nor grieving anything or anyone, accept all people equally and serve me, divinity, in every living creature. Love me most dearly. Do not renounce action itself, but only the sense of doership. Thus, when engaging in worldly actions, be but an instrument of the divine. Mentally cast every thought and act unto me. I know, Arjuna, that you are a good devotee and beloved friend. 
but if you in your egoism do not heed my words, you are lost. If in your vanity you think, I will not fight, that misguided resolve will be in vain, for your own nature will drive you to do it. You can do no greater harm than to fail to follow your inner truth. You have been nurtured in the duties of a warrior leader. Your aptitude, disposition and temperament are such that you must oppose wrongdoing in the world. Following one's nature is the only way to work out one's karma. Seek refuge only in the divine, beloved friend. Always remember the illustrious truth that you have neither existence nor individuality independent of God. Attune your whole life to this truth. Those who do not come fully to me continue to bring agitation and a stressful life upon themselves. I have now taught you the secret of secrets. Reflect upon this fully, Arjuna. Inquire deeply into these teachings, and then act as you choose. Now only listen once more to this most profound secret, the highest of all truths. I tell you this for your everlasting benefit, because you are so very dear to me. Fix your mind on me, give me your whole heart, revere me always and bow before me only. Make me your very own. By these acts you shall discover me and come to me. This divine love is both the means for reaching me and the ultimate goal of all human existence. Taking refuge in me means that you give up the idea that you are the doer. Then it is though all your acts are performed by divinity itself for its sake alone, with no concern about whether the acts are dharmic or adharmic. When you are acting as God for God, it is impossible to do something adharmic. Our impromptu seminar on the principles governing humanity's spiritual development has come to an end, dear warrior. You must not tell the sacred truth to anyone who is not devoted, nor to anyone who speaks ill of me, nor to anyone who does not care to listen. But those who love me and teach these profound secrets to those who are already listening will definitely come to me. No one renders a higher service to me than this, and no one on earth is dearer to me. Those who although not given to teaching others, study the sacred dialogue, are also directly revering me. And even those who simply listen to these words, with faith and acceptance, are liberated from the misfortunes of life and attain the happier worlds. You have been attentive, Arjuna, but have you grasped and understood this teaching? What now of your delusions and ignorance? Arjuna replied, My lord, my delusion has fled. By your grace, the light has dawned. My doubts are gone and I stand before you, ready to do your will. Thank you for watching so far. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please hit the like button. If you're new here, please subscribe. This will ensure that more people can find this resource. Click the notification button so that you can be the first to know about new uploads. And please do comment below. I'll do my best to reply to any questions. Thank you.